Now, this Fred and Abnett is a gentleman that I would really, really like to have known. But if I did, I wouldn't be given the program here, would I? Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a retribute to this gentleman. And I mean, he was truly a gentleman. Let's go on to the next. Okay. And this is guess who? <laughs> oh, where is my stick? Okay. You'll notice one thing about some of us, we don't walk with those little walking sticks that you see that are sold in the stores, you know, when you go one, two, three, and they're up the trail. I always look at, I need a serious walking stick, and I want to be able to put it down the hill, and that's why that Fred and his companions, you're going to see in pictures, actually use these kinds of sticks, much taller than this one. And the reason they did is because when you are crossing a river like the Stillwater or some of the even, even East Rosebud and Rock Creek, they were crossing those and you try to put one of those little metal ones in the creek and it goes, takes off on you. This one here, when you're crossing, you can put that sucker in the creek and you might be up to your waist and you can move yourself across and you can put your weight against it. They are a definite value, but they are designed for off-trail use. You don't really need them on the trail, of course. The other ones work real well, but I find out I can do on-trail sufficiently with this one. Okay, in addition to the the walking stick, I'm going to put it here. His was uh, referred to as an aneroid uh, barometer. And a, an aneroid barometer is, uh, uh, I, don't, I, I never got the opportunity to use those. I used some that were maybe a foot around, registered down to a foot in elevation. And his aneroid one would be very sufficient to get really good elevations, but the, uh, they made simpler ones later. And I used this when I did my map and they didn't have GPS. Long before GPS came out. And the barometers were very, very useful for me, same as it was for him. Okay. Now, we're going to go on to the, uh, the next shot. Okay, this is old Fred himself. We'll move this. You can look at this yourself. Can everybody see that from all the way in the back? Is it, uh, if it can't, don't be, be afraid to move forward a little bit. He was born in Switzerland, and uh, three years later he moved uh, to the U.S. with his parents. And uh, uh, he became a teacher back there in, uh, when he was uh, in Indiana, Wisconsin, eventually. And then 1890, he moved to Montana. Interesting that, uh, and we'll show you a picture of Ubat. And uh, how many has ever heard of Ubat? Well, if you did, you wouldn't be here. Uh, it's long ago. Okay, 1893, he moved to Billings. And uh, then in 1895, he, he was uh, married. We'll go into his family a little later. 1911, he started his own business. And in 1912, he really started with his service um, as school trustee, president of the school board. And uh, he served two terms as county treasurer. And, and uh, from 1916 until his death in 1928, he was uh, the, the county clerk of court. And, and some people can type and some people can't, okay. So anyway, good old You Bet. You Bet is a pretty, was a pretty interesting place. Uh, it was, uh, uh, according to the internet, it said it was the most important stage station in Montana. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, it must have been pretty important. It doesn't exist now. Uh, it's uh, just a few miles north of uh, uh, Judith Gap and about three miles west of Garneal, if you know where that's at. There's not a single building there. I drove out there and looked around, there's nothing. 
And, uh, but anyway, uh, at, at a post office, blacksmith shop, ice house, saloon, stage, uh, barn, stable, everything. I mean, it was in business. Then when the railroad came through, it died, just like a lot of other places did, okay? Uh, okay, next. Okay, Fred's father was a cabinet maker and he knew the art and you can probably read this uh, too in wood carving and uh, it's amazing and uh, eventually finally the family sent me a picture of this of this merry-go-round and it was a beautiful merry-go-round and uh, and, uh, and he also uh, I've got pictures of, of some of these clocks that he man these tall beautiful clocks that he carved okay Fred apparently following his footsteps uh, as the following picture is going to show you uh, a little carving that he did actually it was prior to 1902 and uh, it is in the Yellowstone Museum down in Billings, okay? And this is the clock, and it was donated here by Eugene Elliott of Billings. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool, pretty neat little uh, 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 carving. All of that all the way through, okay. Fred had a long history of public service, and uh, pretty impressive. Uh, like we talked about 1912 and uh, 1916 and uh, uh, unfortunately he, he was uh, he died just a few weeks after he was elected in 1928 and and one of the reasons that he uh, was acknowledged and recognized as the person he was not because he necessarily was a great mountain climber or anything like this it was the kind of a person that he really was he was a man he was always kind considerate sympathetic and as an officer of the court he was courteous and obliging to judges attorneys etc in the conduct of his office he was thorough painstaking systematic and accommodating and so that just kind of sets the the uh, uh, the scene for him especially popular among the foreign people uh, uh, speaking people and uh, because of course you know he came from Switzerland himself his demeanor uh, was modest and unassuming, devoted man, he really was. And he enjoyed a wider circle of friends and was loved by all who knew him. His participation in fraternal organizations enriched his in the lives of many, many people. Okay, he married Nellie uh, uh, Keating in Lewistown in 1895 and uh, they had two daughters, uh, uh, or he had two daughters, Margaret and Doris, they're both gone. Margaret's living uh, child is Janet Chapel. She lives in, in California, and I communicate with her still on an occasion. And I can remember one of the first times that I actually, she walked up to and talked to me, and she, and she saw everything that I had on Fred, and she says, you know more about my granddad than I do. And, and uh, I probably had communicated with over 20 of the relatives going clear back to Wisconsin and all over Montana and everywhere. And uh, big family, uh, great people. And uh, her uh, daughter Beth now runs her business for him. And she ended up calling her business Granite Peak Publications based on the background that uh, of her granddad who was so interested in that. And uh, we knew at one time that uh, Doris's uh, uh, child, Judy Alseth, uh, Nelson was alive. We don't know exactly today, but we knew when we first put the program on that, that she was at that time. Next. Okay. Of course, everybody in this room has seen that from the highway as you're looking across uh, at the tooth. And, uh, and of course, it's said to be one of the landmarks of the, uh, of the name. That tooth and, and many others, of course, and, and uh, as you know, and I believe Pete, that's Whitetail, I think, in the background there. And uh, of course, I'm going to have to ask the expert, right? Okay. So I, I, maybe it's because he was from Switzerland or not, but he had a definite interest in the mountains almost immediately after he moved to Billings. Next, and and this. Uh, 
I don't know if anybody's been up on top of uh, Basin. Uh, that's a vertical angle benchmark. That's uh, by the USGS. And it shows the elevation, and that's immediately above Basin Campground, you know, right up the West Fork. And, uh, and from this is, these are taken from Columbus, and so we can't quite see from the location we took this. And the reason this picture was taken from where it was is because that Lewis and, uh, not Lewis and Clark, I could say just Clark, came down the Yellowstone, you know, in 1806, and he said the mountains, he, he talked about these mountains, and they were all covered with snow. And uh, he, he got to this particular location. We knew where it was from his notes. And uh, so I stood at that same location and took the picture so I could see what uh, Clark took when he went down there. And uh, I, I, it was amazing. He literally, how many, all of those peaks he's climbed. We've, said, we've seen it in Reading that we claimed 50 peaks in the Bertus. Now, I don't know if, if that's true or not, but it's a lot. But anyway, next. And as you go across, that uh, he literally was in each one of these. The East Rosebud, of course, is one of the areas that, uh, where he took off from more than almost all the others combined. Uh, next. And of course, the West Rosebud, he went up and down the West Rosebud and all to the mountains in the back. And then uh, we'll show you pictures of some of that uh, terrain. Next. And. Uh, of course, Mount Wood, named after A.B. Wood, who climbed it in 1898. And uh, he eventually owned uh, the Beartooth Ranch, uh, where the mine owns now, next. And uh, of course, he came down the Stillwater and even went up the Stillwater a time or two on treks. So obviously, he spent a lot of time in the, about roughly 30 years that he spent in the Beartooth. Uh, next. So how did they get there in those early days? They uh, jumped in their nice, uh, <laughs> four yes, four, it was a four-wheeler, right? Yeah, and, uh, and headed up here, right? Shifted gears whenever he needed, right, with these reins. But the very first tracks up here was actually before 1900. And he was knowledgeable of the mountains all the way above East Rosebud, clear up as far as Rainbow Lake, we know, prior to 1901, because he helped lead an expedition up there. It was called the Story of the Wire Gold. And uh, they took horses to Rainbow Lake, if you can imagine, before there was trails. If you've been up, these, up that trail past Rimrock and around, it's absolutely amazing how he would, they got horses up there, but they lost one up there. They had to put it down, turn the other one loose, and when they got back to East Rosebud, the horse was there. And so how that horse got back on its own, they don't know. But anyway, that's how they got there. Uh, and uh, it, uh, that was, at one time was called Armstrong Lake, but that was more local. Uh, according to the USGS, uh, in 1898, it was known as Rosebud Lake. And the very first association was the Rosebud Lake Association. And then it wasn't until 1923 that it actually became the East Rosebud Lake Association. And so the map that uh, uh, they got that name off was is uh, James uh, Kendall, uh, Kimball map of 1898 and there's a copy of the Kimball map uh, on that so anybody that wants afterwards to kind of look at some of this uh, you can and uh, anyway that's how they got there next and one of the persons that he traveled with on a, on a regular basis um, uh, was uh, a gentleman of the name of Baumgartner and uh, he uh, uh, was born in Switzerland in 1866, and uh, he came to Billings in 1882 with the Yegans, uh, both Chris and Peter. Uh, next. He was a famous uh, photographer. Well, one of the cabins that they got to on that very first trip that they really, really decided that they were going to make as a group, not just by himself, but he was going to get with some other folks and do an extended trip considerably into the Beartooth Mountains, and so they got as far as what they called the uh, the Armstrong Cabin, and uh, this is uh, uh, Fred right here. 
pretty rough when it gets blown up that much. It gets pretty grainy. Uh, it's, it's an interesting cabin. Uh, when they got there at that time, Armstrong didn't own it. Armstrong had sold the place uh, to a gentleman that was name of uh, Chapman from Red Lodge, and then also uh, 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 the Yegans. And then they started the association, of course, and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, the treasurer for them. And uh, anyway, they got there the first couple of nights and rested. I can't imagine riding in a wagon all the way from Billings. You'd want to rest a couple of days anyway, wouldn't you? And when they got there, they uh, slept a couple of nights, and uh, they finally uh, got uh, really, really tired of the mice crawling over their face at night, so they decided to get out of the cabin. And uh, anyway, Anyway, there was there's two rooms. There's a back room and there's no door between them. And you can kind of see a little bit of the back of that of, of that of that cabin back here. And then the front. The women stayed back there and uh, at night and the, and the men stayed this was more of them in the front part and uh, like Mr. Armstrong says there's no hanky panky going on in my cabin. Next. So on that, that particular trip, uh, they, of course, went to East Rosebud Lake, and you can click as we go here, dear. Okay, and they went up to, to the uh, uh, mouth of, uh, uh, of the, uh, what we called uh, Snow Creek, and, uh, uh, and, and I'm gonna show you pictures of this a little bit later, but I'm gonna follow through on a map so you can kind of follow about where they're at. They went up uh, past the Snow Lakes and to and climbed their first twelfth or first peak. There was Mount Abnett. They climbed it, and then went all the way over to the ridge. Uh, and here's Castle. And then they went on the and climbed these peaks around through here and followed along. And uh, and then at this particular point, they could see from up up higher up. They could look at Granite Peak, and uh, then they went on down uh, to. Uh, and that was pretty interesting. Uh, uh, so now I'll give you a little bit more information that goes. Okay. Now this is what your girl would have seen. <laughs> so there's those falls. That's the first thing that they saw as they, uh, they uh, uh, climbed past uh, what they call the silver sprays of snow falls and this and then and this is the train that you're going to go through that's the best part of the train that they would have been in and the past snow lakes to the flower garlanded parks in the foot of the snow banks and uh, uh, after they climbed they climbed that was the first peak that they climbed and they went on up and around and then there's the some of the flower garden uh, that you see in the Beartooths and we all that's one of the things we enjoy a lot about the Beartooths isn't it okay and uh, anyway, next. Then they made their ascent to the top of what is Mount Avenue and then went on into uh, beyond Castle Rock. And once they got up in the Castle Rock country, they would have went west. And uh, uh, Pete, I, I, I used the best picture that we had that associated with that, thanks to Pete Shelley, that this picture happens actually even exists. And uh, the... Uh, as you can see, look at this terrain. Look at the country that they would have been going into. This was taken during the summer. This was not a wintertime picture, okay? And so a little bit of fresh snow can make quite a difference up there. Uh, anyway, next. And there's a lot of things that you're gonna see up there in that kind of country up there. You get up there pretty high. Here they're on an overhang uh, as an abnet and, and, and two of the buddies that he was with when he, when he made that climb. And uh, uh, Alfred Baumgartner carried uh, on the top of his packs. They had like 70 pound packs. And on top of that 70 pound packs, the Baumgartner carried a box with all the glass plates in it to take pictures in. So you can imagine how tough those guys would have been. And, and in this kind of country that they were carrying that. And you notice what he's got over his shoulder, you know. And uh, anyway, next picture. Well, we about lost it there. Okay. And uh, 
Anyway, the, they were greeted with magnificent expanse uh, and gem-like lakes. And uh, this just happens to be one that I filled in that uh, uh, John had, uh, had given me. And that uh, some of you might recognize that. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I probably shouldn't say it's turgles, it's whatever anyway. But, uh, but the gem-like lakes and glittering glaciers and massive peaks and to the land that uh, I am using the wording that uh, uh, William Banfield used in his book uh, on, on him. Anyway, they hit us uh, uh, on uh, a hailstorm and a torrent of snow, walking in blinding, blinding sun with four inches of new snow. How many times have you been up there, Pete, and you've hit a little bit of snow? Just a little bit of snow. Okay, next. Anyway. They, uh, they swung across the high ridge of the East Rosebud uh, and uh, or the divide between that and the Clark's Fork. And then they, uh, they got to a point they could see Pilot and Index Peaks above the Clark's Fork River. And that's in the distance there. Next. And uh, anyway, the party then turned where the lofty comb of the crest of the Granite Peak beckoned them to a contest, which was afterwards to become one of the chief lures that brought an amnet back again and again at its sides. Then by the waterfalls and lakes, they returned down the, the East Rosebud drainage to their point of beginning. They were scarred and battered by wind and sun. Von Eschen's nose was swollen to the size of a man's hand. They were footstore, lame of back and weary. But the experience and the pictures they brought back repaid them for the discomforts they had endured. That was the first short trip that they made. Next. And that's pretty neat. Okay. The next trip was uh, uh, that he was up there every year, but the next trip we got recorded, of course, was uh, in uh, uh, 1908. And they actually went by railroad up to Camp Senia, and then they went over the divide, no trail, we went on over to East Rosebud Lake, went up, and then eventually went up with the, what we know as Arch Creek, okay? They went up Arch Creek, and I just threw those in. Uh, I know now more by the notes that they actually went up. They saw the arch, worked its uh, way around from the arch, and I got pictures of those when we'll show you those, which is about right in here. And then it was on the divide, and they actually worked their way up this way to Mount Peel. Next. So once they, uh, they made a Mount Peel next, they went on over to uh, where that they could go to the uh, top of Tempest and got a closer look at Granite Peak and then eventually went on down to Mystic and went out. So here they are. They start in Red Lodge and then end up clear over there uh, in, in the West Rosebud. And this is a picture of John Bronger. This is one of the first one that's known and it was uh, taken on that particular trip in 1908. And, uh, the, uh, uh, but that does not do justice to what that arch is. If you actually standing underneath it, it's it's it to me, it's considerably more impressive than that. Here is the the East Rosebud drainage down below. You go up Arch Creek, you uh, and you work your way up, and here's the bottom of it. And then look at here. I'm standing here on the side of it. Look how much taller it is height-wise by a person than what it was where he was standing. He was standing out in front of it up above. And so that is, is, is really uh, an impressive feature. And I don't know if anybody have, anybody have ever been to the arch and, and have the opportunity to stand underneath it. It's, uh, it uh, I think it's quite an experience. It's a, it's a uh, beautiful opportunity. Uh, next. And they continued on and look at the massive of the countries here. The arch was right over in here, worked their way up, come around on the ridge, and instead of going along on the ridge, we went on over and dropped down into the lake and, and where we had started back in this neck of the woods over here when we made the trick that day. That was just a short trek. Okay, but they worked their way around on the ridge, went up to Mount Peel, and on over to uh, Tempest Mountain next. And one of the things Banfield talks about is the turquoise lakes. And uh, of course it's uh, based on the glacial uh, milk uh, on that and why it gets the color that it does. And this is Brent Lake and once upon a time it uh, produced uh, uh, trout four, five, and six pounds. And uh, 
<laughs> it didn't the day I was there. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it is beautiful. And they would have seen that from up on the ridge where they went. They would have looked right down into Brant. So that's uh, one of the reasons that they refer to the color of some of these lakes, especially with Brent next. And when they got, of course, over on to, uh, to Tempest and they looked across and, um, and Fred talked about uh, the, the uh, pretty frightful views at this point. That would look like that would be pretty almost unclimbable. Uh, and uh, it is to me too, because Fred, I mean, Pete's been there 44, 45 times more than me, okay? <laughs> And uh, me, and, uh, me and Fred's been there the same number of times. Okay, so anyway, uh, next. Then they went on down and come back out the West Rose. But but one of the uh, the locations that they started from more cases than not was of course was East Rosebud Lake, and we're at the upper end, and we're looking down. And uh, this actually is my dad in a boat. Uh, he came up to give us a ride, and we said we just waved at him and walked back. But uh, we had fished on up to uh, the next lakes or two. But anyway, uh, at one point, uh, they eventually uh, finished the, uh, up there. How many, I'm, I'm sure everybody here has probably seen that uh, up there. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, in fact, we gave this program one time in that building, didn't we, Jeff, uh, on that, yeah. And uh, that, uh, uh, anyway, that's a lot of the places they started from next. But the, the, of course, Granite Peak was a calling for them. They constantly wanted to actually climb Granite Peak. That was one of their objectives up there. And, uh, and so this is uh, John Bronger, and here's Fred. And I think that's Tom Sipes right there, and I think that's uh, uh, Ernst Vogel, uh, who was uh, actually uh, climbed it in 1926, and we'll talk about it later uh, uh, next. But this is one of the drainages that they, uh, uh, they often went up. And it was interesting that, uh, you remember I said that they stayed at Shannon's cabin? It was, you know, it was Armstrong's cabin, but they met uh, uh, Sh uh, Shannon. Well, Shannon, uh, is what they named this uh, creek by, and it was just their own name. And uh, now we know this is Phantom Creek, but when you get down uh, right at about, what, about right there, from there on down is Armstrong Creek. Forget, Armstrong had to, to be survived somehow on it. So that, that creek has got two different names uh, on it. But you work your way up, and, and at this point, you're just about to break on over into Phantom uh, Lake. And from there, you can work your way up on top and, and, and go from there. But this is uh, uh, one of the drainages that they came up on a regular basis. Uh, in 1910, they made a serious attempt and they went up that particular direction. They approached from Tempest Mountain, which presented frightful views. There was, they thought that there had to be an easier look. I mean, there had to be an easier way up that mountain than that east side and that north face. But uh, anyway, they did not get a chance to, to, to climb the peak. And so uh, they just hooked on over and went to Cook City. Went by uh, Grasshopper Glacier and went down to Goose Lake and went on into Cook City. That was just nothing for them. There's no trails. But they, but, and here they are. Okay, so here, uh, we're going to skip a few years, and, uh, and then in, uh, here is uh, uh, one of the tracks that they made. And I think I got a picture of, of a couple of the guys that were with them here a little bit later on. But in 1919, they decided to go ahead and go up the West Rosebud. And of course, we know the trail comes up around here and then works its way around and, and about right through here and comes around and comes down into it. This you can see where water's coming over the, over the dam. And uh, Jim Annan thought that uh, since when they, they put the, um, uh, uh, the pipeline in uh, for the power plant, that the very first year, they, when they blew that out, 
They ran all the water in that in that fall, big enough. They knew what the flow they knew what the flow rates were up there. So they built that pipeline big enough to handle the flow for winter time, and they and they diverted all the water through there. And at, and that particular year, there was no water went over the falls. So Jim Annan says the the falls are dead. They were been so beautiful all these years, and all of a sudden now uh, we don't have those falls anymore. Well, it was only that one year they built the dam, and after that, then. Of course, this is in 2008, I think. Yeah, in 2008, when I was on the tram coming around. And uh, you had to get just the right person to let you on that tram. But when we were kids, as long as you got there at like 6 o'clock in the morning, you could ride the tram. They didn't care who you were. And I, I don't know how many times, dozens of times we rode that tram where we were there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And one time my coach said, he was mad at me because I was driving, I drove too slow and I got there too late and we had to walk. And he, and he let me know what, anyway. But it's a beautiful falls, there's no doubt about it. Uh, anyway, next. From Mystic Lake they went on up past Island and thank you Pete for the picture and they went on up and eventually went all the way up onto Grasshopper Glacier and uh, above Silver Lake and stuff. And we Luna. And Namidji, uh, as you can see, early on in uh, in the summer, uh, it's still got a little ice on it. And I've been in there later in the year, and it still had ice on it. It's getting up there in the air pretty good. But, uh, but uh, anyway, after they left Grasshopper Glacier, and they went around, and uh, of course, uh, from the uh, with all the, you know, it's so different now. How many has ever seen any grasshoppers in that glacier up there? <laughs> I've been there several times and I have never seen a grasshopper in it. I think it's already down and they, and then back up again and so it isn't like it used to be, okay? And uh, the, uh, what slide are we on? <laughs> Forty. Mm -hmm. Very good. I thought I might have went past one. <laughs> okay. So after they went to Grasshopper Glacier, the next they went on around and went past the Arrow Lakes, went on down all the way to the East Rosebud, which would have been down in this neck of the woods, and then on back down to, to East Rosebud Lake. And uh, they camped at Rim Rock, somewhere in that vicinity, and they and uh, they got absolute wet snow and rain and it just soaked them and Fred made the statement one more night like this will heal me from ever wanting to be in these mountains again they, they must have been lightly slightly cool okay this is a picture that uh, our son took okay then uh, shortly after that then uh, there's uh, uh, Fred and notice he's pull my golly, he's using it for something besides hiking with, too. And this is this William Banfield, who was uh, the one that wrote the tribute we'll, we'll talk more about. And uh, they decided they were going to make a, uh, an effort to try to go after uh, uh, Granite Peak again. Okay. And uh, so, next. So, of course, after he had looked at the, the north face and the east uh, ridge, he wasn't sure that that was how you should climb that peak. He was convinced that maybe there's got to be a better way up that mountain. So he went around to the to the south side, and this Joe uh, took this picture from uh, 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 from Kern uh, Mountain, and you're looking at it, and it still looks like quite a mountain, doesn't it? Yeah, and. Of course, Pete's been up here and here and here and here, whatever. Okay, but I won't. Uh, I won't go into that. Anyway, uh, next, and they uh, they decided that they were going to work their way around, and they thought that this notch would be maybe the way that old V-shaped notch, and uh, and they climbed up this V-shaped crotch and um, uh, and between the two domes, 200 feet below the summit, where they encountered sheer walls, made it impossible to go any further. So at this particular point. Somewhere right in here is about where they decided that they quit. You know, that they were going to go up in up in here, and uh, retreating down the chute, 
They decided to cross to the opposite side. Namrat lost his footing and, and catapulted down the icy incline. But fortunately, a shelf six or eight feet wide stopped his fall in a pocket of ice and snow. He said, by golly, that was the luckiest thing I ever fell into, he said. So, so he brushed himself off and gazed down the rest of the incline to the slide rock and talus below. Uh, the party then traveled on to Cook City. And bingo, what the heck, you know, let's just skip on over to Cook City. And, uh, and then they returned by what they known as, the, they called the Moose Haunted Lakes of the Clark Fork and across glaciers on the way back to Camp Senia. So here they are. Look at, the, look at the terrain and the travels and everything else that they did. At, uh, at another glacier, it was necessary to cut footholds across a narrow tongue of ice which terminated after a steep incline in a high wall of ice. And any misstep might have had fatal consequences. I remember when I was up to Medicine Lake, uh, there I'd come across uh, uh, one of the drainages and was cutting around uh, doing some mapping. I was going up to Karen Lake and that, uh, it got steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper, and all of a sudden it looked like that the, the, where I was walking into was just straight down into that lake. And so I did the same thing that he did. I cut footholds from about from here to, the, <laughs> uh, to about halfway across the building here, cut footholds and, and walked in those footholds all around. So uh, I got to, I look at that and I thought, you know, Fed, I would have remembered exactly what you're saying right there. Okay. And um, then east of Cook City, more than half of the timber was either when they returned, either burned or blown down, making intermingled granite boulders, making travel almost impossible. Am I still okay? Can you still hear me? Okay, very good. Okay. Now, this, uh, thank you, Pete. And, uh, uh, and Pat, that uh, uh, this kind of is a, a good description of the first uh, ascent that was made by uh, uh, two different parties. And, and uh, Banfield writes, largely through the efforts of Anabinet, the Forest Service became interested in conquering Granite Peak. In late August of, uh, of 23, uh, Robert Ferguson, supervisor of the Beartooth Forest, Joseph Whittem, uh, supervisor of the Custer Sioux Forest, and Eaters Koch, and I guess that's how you pronounce that, I've been told, uh, as assistant director of the, uh, Forester at Missoula made the attempt along with the and any party from Billings. Now if you really want to read a little bit more about that, one of the best books that's, that's ever been written. And a lot of this kind of history in it, and this showed via pictures, showed pictures of them all throughout that entire uh, expedition and showed the pictures of the guys and names of every one of the guys and everything else. So this book has probably got 300 pictures in it. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, this book is worth 300,000 words, a quarter of a million words. And I'll tell you what, it's worth it. I don't know how many own this book, but if you don't, you need to have it. It's, I'm sure you sell it here. Come on. You, sell, you, you, you do sell the book here? You better sell the book here because this young lady wrote the book. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. I mean, I can't believe how much I have used this book. And, and, uh, Tell them all. What's the name of the book? Oh, the name of the book is called Images of America, Beartooth Mountains by Patty. Okay? You've got to get that book. So when you leave here, you go buy a book from Patty. Okay. Anyway, the group gathered at East Rosebud and took pack horses uh, to a point on the plateau, yeah. and uh, currently known as the Froze to Death Plateau. Okay. I don't know how it got its name, but I'm guessing. And uh, the next evening, they had a council of war. And it was interesting how William Banfield used his 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 wording to to, to describe what was taking place. I'm sure, and uh, on the shores of Avalanche Lake, which at that time was on the on the opposite side where we have Avalanche Lake now. See how names get moved around a little bit somehow accidentally, but it, but uh, and on the map that we've got in here now, it's it's called Lowry Lake, or it's it's one of the uh, granite uh, lakes. And on the morning of uh, 
uh, of August 29th, the three foresters approached the peak from the southeast ridge, while the Anamna party approached from the south at a point to the, to the right of their attempt of the previous year. And they included one of the other gentlemen that was from the Forest Service, so he had joined Anamna. Okay, when the, when the Anamna party reached a point where they encountered per, the same old perpendicular walls, and asked Pete, he'll tell you exactly where they're talking about. And they heard the triumphant shouts of the successful Forester's party. Granite Peak was finally conquered, August 29, 1923. It must have been a disappointment to Fred to not have been one of the first to reach the summit, but he never ever showed any resentment. He was on the return down Granite Creek on this and another trip, and Abnett said, the old fellow who made Granite Peak must have had a lot of stuff left over and just dumped it in there. I thought the last time I was here that no one would ever catch me here again, but here I am. And uh, okay, next. And this is a picture, uh, according to Joe Joseph, and that uh, as you work your way up, Pete, as you come up that little chute, at the, at the angle you come up, and you come up and you hit that kind of that ridge right there, and you work your way across. And Joe said that's where they took this picture from, and he was going to go in there and, and study that area a little bit more where that perpendicular wall was. And uh, uh, I've talked to Pete before on it, and he's pointed out where that perpendicular wall is. So <laughs> I'm sure he's climbed up around that and up into that, uh, like he said, how many times. Okay, anyway, next. One of the things that uh, uh, it was interesting that Fred enjoyed was the, was the wildlife. But he had a lot of fear uh, of moose. And uh, he had more fear of moose than he did of bears, even though they did have a bear one time that ravaged their tent. And in one time they had a bobcat that while they were in the tent, a bobcat jumped in there. Their so-called tents were probably like lean-tos, and they were open on one side, and they called it a tent. And this bobcat jumped in on one of the guys, and he hollered like mad, and, uh, and Fred said, don't worry, it's just a bobcat. <laughs> and, <laughs> And anyway, uh, this particular picture here was taken by uh, uh, my Lonnie, our son, and uh, we got us just as close as we could possibly get where we thought we were safe and didn't want to get any closer at all, but we got right up to it. And that's not taken with a, t a telephoto lens. That was just a regular lens. And just as we got right there, Lonnie rolled down the window and took the picture. <laughs> so we didn't think we were in a lot of danger, but we didn't want to get too close, we'd scare him away. But one of the things that, that he, he talked about also was with the animals was sheep and goats and stuff like that. This particular, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, Nanny and her little kid, uh, uh, Wade was, we were in Lone Elk, I think, up there just at the headwaters of uh, 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 and when the drainage is going into granite. And, uh, and he said, look over your shoulder. And I look around, and here, about from here, not much further away from where Patty's sitting to me, she walked all the way around me, and the kid was just following her. Walked all the way around and got up right above him. And I swear that goat was not 15 feet from him. And she was so, I just, I couldn't believe how interested that she was with his throwing that, he'd throw that lure out there and they're both their heads would go that way and he'd reel it back and they'd follow back, he'd throw it out there again and her head would move. Finally, after about five or six, she finally said, this is enough of this, I'm leaving. And the goat like says, hey, just throw it one more time, you know. He just, just couldn't quit. Well, one of the things that it was, uh, interesting about Fred is that he did like to take pictures. Uh, they eventually must have developed cameras over and above the gla big glass plates that, that uh, Baumgartner used to take. And so I'm sure they had those little box cameras at that time and whatever. And uh, he would uh, get out of his tent and then go out and watch the sunrise. And then this one, he says, oh, fellers, as he comes back to the tent, he says, wake up, he says, he says, I think I got some real pictures. And, and this was up, uh, I think we were at, at Lower Arch Lake uh, on the drainage, kind of going up towards Little Arch. And uh, we were camped back in here. And, and this, was, this was years before I ever knew anything about Fred. 
and I'd get out of the tent doing the same thing Fred was doing and wait for the sun up and then and get pictures of it and that really didn't I don't think even did justice to what that was that morning but that sun hitting that was just phenomenal just beautiful and uh, and but he talked in his book about how Fred enjoyed the scenery and the, and the mountains and the, and the lakes and uh, and wait till he get a good caption of a good picture. This uh, this is up the West Rosebud at Franco. How many's been up to Franco? And. Uh, and that night, it was really, really pretty. And that picture doesn't do justice because that mountain looked just about that color uh, on it. My camera didn't do good. And he'd even comment about the pink snow. That's about as pink as you're gonna get with it. It's a little on the red side. And uh, not anything you wanna dip your cup into. But uh, uh, but it uh, but he noticed how how you know those kinds of things when he was up there. I never thought anything about it because anybody that was probably just you know like ourselves would would do the same thing. Uh, next, so anyway, uh, we're going on. He. Uh, uh, Let's see, that one is, okay. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah. Uh, they, they uh, yeah, okay. I had to catch myself here just a little bit where I was at. Uh, they took a, a, a group of these guys, and we're gonna show you some pictures of these guys that made this trek. An amazing, absolute amazing trek. And uh, uh, they took the train up to, to Red Lodge, and Al uh, Krumquist uh, picked them up and drove them up to Camp Senia. And Senia, of course, you know the name of, of Senia. It was, it was named after his wife. And uh, they, th then they used a couple of pack horses to, to go from there uh, up next uh, to Timberline Lake. And then from there, they were on their own. And uh, uh, Margaret went back with, uh, with the horses. They, they climbed Silver Run Peak. That was the first peak they climbed. Then they climbed the other peak on the way, and I just shorted it and, and uh, went on down to Ritual Lodge, stayed there. And then they went on up, and actually they, uh, they went up the, all the way uh, to Ritual Lodge. And then... Uh, uh, they went this way, actually, uh, because I didn't put all of these in there as close as they did, but they went up and they went by this particular lake, went right on around, went around right here and ran, and actually right down. And I, and I know exactly how they went because uh, Banfield, amazingly so, in those 13 days, wrote all these notes of the exact detail of exactly where they traveled. And uh, we, we accidentally encountered this because William Banfield had nephews that I went to high school with. They didn't even know they had an uncle because he died before they were ever born. And uh, so we got a hold of one of them one of them got a hold of one of the other ones, and uh, this one of the aunts had the original notes, and so she retyped the notes for us. So that was pretty, pretty phenomenal. Anyway, uh, then they went down to what they call Johnson Sawtooth Ranch, and down to Deep Lake, and uh, we got some pictures of that we'll show you. Then up to Hickox Beartooth Lodge, and from there they headed into what they were hoping to find, Crazy Lake. But they got a little bit lost, and uh, and they went down to the to uh, uh, the Clark's Fork again, and then uh, went on up to Cook City, and then from there they went up to Grasshopper Glacier, then back over to Lake Abundance, and then a leisure trip down the Stillwater. And so here they are. They leave from Red Lodge, walk all the way up around from there, and then come out clear down in in the Stillwater. It turned out, and I went back in, as I know from the notes, once I got the notes, I could follow it along exactly where they went, and on my Google, I could figure it out. They traveled roughly 200 miles in that two weeks with those packs, and uh, 
the elevation change of climbing the peaks that they did, because I just shot them on here. They, it doesn't show all the peaks they climbed. And uh, roughly 30,000 elevation changes in that particular distance time. They were pretty tough hombres. Okay, next. Okay, this is part of the guys. There's one guy here that uh, is not in this picture that's in the next one. And of course, here's Fred. And Margaret, that's his, uh, his uh, daughter, and uh, that's his, uh, her husband. And here's William Banfield, John Tanzel, and, uh, uh, and here's, interestingly enough, here's uh, Al Crumquist. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I thought that was pretty neat. Okay, then they, you know, they had the horses, Margaret and, and Senia went back. And uh, the picture got kind of, you know, wetted. But anyway, uh, notice they had a little different pack at that point in time. See, some of the packs, quite a bit different. They were starting to get into a little bit more modernization with, the, with, their, with their packs. But notice the pack. Yeah. But notice their poles. Look how tall that pole is. They didn't mess around. When you're up, and you're off trail, and you want to put that pole down to help balance yourself working your way around. Those long poles are amazingly an advantage, okay? Uh, and then from there, they went up past the Hercules Pillar and around and then climbed that peak and then went back on around and made that trek that we're talking about next. And this is actually was his pack, okay? Next. And... Uh, uh, next, and of course Baumgart always carried that big supply of photographic plates. Uh, this particular pack frame is what they call a Trapper Nelson's Indian Jack Board, manufactured by Charles Traeger in Seattle, Washington. I thought that was pretty cool. Next. And uh, this is Charles Weldon or, uh, down at the museum when we uh, uh, were down there looking at some of his stuff. Anyway, that, remember we talked about Johnson's uh, Camp Sawtooth Ranch? This was uh, sometime after 1923. Gary Bradshaw uh, gave me this picture uh, because his family took that over after Johnson retired from it. And then the, uh, Bradshaw's lived in Luther. And he said they'd have as many as 40 or more horses and they'd leave from Luther and they would trail those horses all the way up and then all the way into, uh, into uh, Camp Sawtooth, which is just above Deep Lake. And so that was pretty cool. Here's a picture looking down uh, that Gary had uh, uh, given me. And uh, I've been down to, uh, with Gary, down to Deep Lake, and I've been to Deep Lake uh, from this direction down here, and up this way, I've been from this other side, and then down to here, and then down into it too. So I've been into it from different sides uh, when I was mapping that area. When they uh, left Camp Satooth, they went on up to uh, uh, the Butte there, and uh, here's the lake. And uh, from there, they were trying to head on into this lake that they called the Crazy Lakes. Well, <laughs> look at this map. And, and uh, you know how many lakes there are in that neck of the woods up there. And it's no wonder they got lost. And they had, they had quite the conversations. And in this particular neck of the woods, when I was mapping this back in the 80s, I had the USGS, early USGS maps. And I had stereo photography for me at the time, and I wouldn't go more than a quarter mile, and I'd put my trail in. I'd go another quarter mile, and I was stereo, and i look at the terrain and put, my, put it in. And I mapped that entire country that way, uh, all, every trail in, in, in that neck of the woods. I'll tell you what, that was a challenging country, and even the guides that have hunters in that area said they will never turn a, uh, a dude loose, even if he's been there 10 times, they will not turn him loose. He has a guide with him every day, all the time, because it's real easy to get lost. And that's why the USGS, when they mapped that country, they were off half three quarters of a mile from time on the trails. And they supposedly walked them out and they were still off. So that is really challenging country. Now, let's look at Beartooth Boot now and look at, look at the lakes around it. 
And those maps, those early maps didn't have any lakes to speak of. They had Beartooth Lake and maybe a couple others. No wonder they got a little confused of which one was Crazy Lakes. But the map that they used, besides uh, the uh, one other one that I showed you, was the 1918 Forest Service map, and it's got the Crazy Lake on there that they were headed to, so I'm sure that they would have had this 1918 map uh, with them. But try to find your way through the country, uh, that's another thing. Okay, next. They went on to Cook City, remember? And uh, here they are at the Cook City store. It looks the same now with right out in front. That building is still there. And there's another building in between now, but uh, doing a little boot work, huh? Okay, next. So the following year, 1926, they, uh, uh, they started to, uh, from a different route. Now they started up the still water from the Beartooth Ranch, and they were going to go up into the Lake Plateau and start walking some of this country up in here. And they climbed these peaks up in here, and then, then they went to Cook City, climbing the peaks in between. They went back to Goose Lake. But when they got to, uh, to Goose Lake, uh, they ran across a, a, a gentleman uh, named Norman Clyde. What, what slide number were we on? Okay. Okay, 61. Okay, I'll get to my nose for 61. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, uh, and they got to Norman Clyde. Uh, the... Uh, they had five inches, when they got up to the top of the, uh, of the uh, plateaus up there, they had five inches of snow on the ground the next morning at Wounded Man. And uh, so you can imagine what it's like climbing from then on. Uh, they took the horses back on some of them, the other ones went on to uh, Goose and, and Glacier. And uh, when they got to Goose, uh, this Norman Clyde was a Sierra Club climber, accepted in Avenue Services as a guide to Granite Peak. Okay. Um, then he and Vogel then made the, su the second successful ascent of Granite Peak, and Navdit and Rickson did not make the attempt. Okay. Okay. Uh, they, as you can see there, they went after they left Granite Peak, uh, they went back on down to East Rosebud Lake. Okay. Now, and uh, this is a picture of John Bronger and his wife a little later on in life. He was a guide. He actually guided in Switzerland. Next. And then his son. And uh, the, there's uh, uh, pictures of, of his sons being with them up there. Uh, they had a ranch uh, uh, at, uh, uh, and actually Bronger named Alpine. And his ranch is the Teal Ranch below there uh, as you're coming into East Rosebud. Okay, next. Here are some of the guys, notice the packs, and notice the poles, and uh, some of his companions. Same way here. Next. Yeah, we've got some notes on this one. Which one's this one? 65. What slide? 65. 60, 65, no, there's no notes in 65. I got 63 and 66. 67. I'll have to go home and get that note. I'm sorry. Okay. And, uh, okay. Um, but this uh, Fred uh, uh, Krieg gave me this picture, and that, I think that's his dad, isn't it? Pretty sure that's his dad. Yeah, it would have to be, because Fred's still alive with us. <laughs> okay. And uh, John Tanzel and, and uh, with Fred and Anna. Okay. Uh, now, next. This is with this one. This is What's that? This is 66. Okay, 66. Very good. I'm glad you said that. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go on into the next one then. It says, uh, okay, his last journey, and I don't have pictures of his, uh, 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 the attempted ascent in 1927 of, Ga of Gannon Peak in Wyoming. Uh, but uh, anyway, they made an attempt. Unfortunately, the weather did not cooperate and the party had to turn back. They returned uh, back to Yellowstone Park. His horseback uh, ride up Dinwiddie Creek uh, the horse he was riding was, uh, uh, it was noteworthy. He was riding a steed called Lightning. 
who was anything but a credit to the best uh, equine traditions. At times, Lightning made a show of life that showed a hint of his long past colthood, but Fred was persistent and dug in his heels and said, giddy up, Lightning, until the goaded animal broke into a short, live ample. The unintentional <laughs> uh, humor's never lost <laughs> its savors. <laughs> okay, now, next. So, this last Six, okay, this is 67. Slide 67 is effort to make the bear tooth better known. Okay, it was building of his relief map. In this, in this tool shop, he spent long hours night after night toiling over his frame. Painstaking and accurate about every detail. When the model was completed with the clay molded over the contour strips of wood to conform as exactly as he could have made it, he, uh, uh, and he used glass to depict the, uh, the larger lakes. Mirror Lake was one of the smaller lakes in the Beartooth, and when we, f we, when we refurbished that lake, it had glass. Absolutely every lake in there was glass inside of this. And you can see Yellowstone Lake and, and uh, uh, the authenticity to that. And then the pantograph up there is how he would use his maps that he had, which really wasn't very good, but the pictures that he took and everything helped him and to help generate that. And then after he would, he would uh, then go ahead. This is not necessarily vegetation. Uh, uh, down here of uh, uh, being uh, noted by its color. This is more the terrain above Timberline. And here's the Tetons down here. This is Yellowstone Lake. And he was still working on this map. Uh, he started in 1922, and uh, it was used at the Outdoor uh, World's Fair in 1925. And, uh, and then even later on in other exhibits and stuff. Anybody that wanted to use the map could. And uh, He's, as you can see, go back. As you can see, he's working on this one and see how those layers were made. They were all cut out in wood. Everything was cut out in wood. And then he would then go ahead and use the, uh, uh, and mold the clay over it. And then carve into the clay so they would match the topography. And I have gone in and I have worked on this map extensively and I found out that it, the, the detail of accuracy is absolutely amazing. And uh, I've got multiple, multiple pictures here of it if you'd like to see it next. But uh, here uh, it is. And here's the Baratus. And uh, this is down into Wyoming, down into Cody. And uh, here's the Tetons down here, and here's Yellowstone Lake. But it, uh, uh, it took us, uh, I don't know how long we took, we, we spent two or three weeks uh, refurbishing this lake because, or this map, because it was in a terrible condition. And so we spent a lot of time on it. I've got a lot of pictures of where we went in and, and cleaned up and worked on them. And uh, John Matovich uh, from Columbus made the table for us, and it fit on it. And all the four pieces, there's four pieces on here that fit on here. And then we have the slides down here, and then we have uh, uh, all of these are named down here so you can tell what it means. Next. And this is in the museum there. Uh, we'll get into this in here in just a few minutes, uh, but if you're there uh, in Columbus at the Museum of the Beartooths, uh, page by page, this goes into the history of the map and, and, and great detail of how he made it. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, Okay, a few uh, months after his 1927 trip, the encroachment of disease began to make themselves felt. He still loved to talk about the mountains, but the thought, uh, it was past him, and uh, it brought melancholy reflections. On the afternoon of November 11th, 1928, Fred and Amnett passed away. In his eulogy, this is uh, John Tanzel here, 
said, Mr. Namnet was a man of unique character in many ways. No one could be associated with him without any way, without being drawn to him with bands of steel. He was a happiness dispenser, always jovial and sunny in nature. He was the most accommodating man I ever knew, inspiring of, of time, trouble, and expense in helping those who came to him. He was especially the friend of the foreign born. He was a friend of all men, the rich respected him. He was loved by those by the uh, moderate circumstances until it might be said that the poor almost worshipped him. As Mr. Anamnet climbed in the mountains with an ambition to scale the loftiest peaks, so his character seemed to rise above all the mean thoughts of life and found place for nothing but noble themes. He loved the Beartooth Mountains and their boundless nature became a part of his own character. I know little of his creed, but his life was that of a Christian, a man of noble attributes, akin to the mountains that he loved. And uh, next. Well. We won't have time for a few questions yet. Okay, yeah, we're about done here. Okay, I'm sorry this has taken so long here. Okay, shortly after his death, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, this writer, uh, William Banfield, uh, wrote this tribute book. Okay, and uh, next. And uh, they, uh, uh, this peak up here, they, they actually then went ahead and uh, named it after him. They had the, well, went all the way through, uh, and then uh, they had this dedication. Uh, then this uh, uh, tablet was made up, and, uh, and uh, they had this tablet made, and they were going to take this tablet. 31 pounds is this tablet, and we weighed it, uh, Jeff, and I remember giving it to you down there that day. <laughs> and. Uh, they were going to put it up on top of Mount Anamana, but they only got as far as the Snow Lakes. And that was as far as they got with it next. And, uh, and this is where they plotted it. And uh, uh, anyway, of course, this is one of the Brongers there. And this is where they plotted it, right in that lake. They, they put it on there, had their flowers with it, okay. But later on, the, um, uh, the tablet, as you can see, uh, became really, really abused. It came off the lake, and it was eventually was carried up there. And then uh, 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 Wayne McLean, uh, at this point, he was really getting to where it was really tough shape, and he climbed up there and left uh, a tablet there, and he placed this register up there. Uh, uh, later on, I think he did it in 2014, but he's the one that carried the tablet down where we could get it and get it refurbished, uh, Jeff. Okay, and eventually uh, we had to put in, here's the trailhead down here, and eventually we end up with it about right over in here, and this happens to be the rock that was moved over to here. And, and <laughs> I'm telling stories here again, Jeff. Okay, anyway, they had a rededication uh, ceremony for him again in 2010, and guess who? Sitting right there, and uh, uh, and Jeff presided over that. No one was more dedicated than Jeff on this project. His uh, uh, granddaughter Janet Chapel was there, and uh, she was the un she unveiled it uh, that day. Next, and then uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was kind of fun when it when it, yeah it was kind of fun. And there's uh, uh, what it looked like now after we had it refurbished and we had new bolt covers put in and made by a gentleman there in Park City who made the new bolt covers for us. And uh, that day we had quite a uh, time down there at the, uh, at the end. And then eventually uh, Donna Sullinger from the Forest Service, that's pretty impressive, the work that she did, wasn't it, Jeff? And she put it together, took pictures, and uh, Fred and all, and uh, and uh, eventually we got that uh, uh, then dedicated, and here's Jeff uh, and Janet, and then Trouty uh, on it. And I don't know his name, I'm not sure, but anyway, <laughs> it's the only one that we didn't know. But uh, that was, uh, uh, was a lot of fun. Here's the, the trailhead, so if you ever go all the way up to the upper trailhead, it's just short of it, and you'll see it. Okay, next. That's it. Okay. Okay.